This calcium-rich shell protects one of life's most majestic creatures. The unborn juvenile shorebird. All the sights the egg baby will see. Boom! They hatch! And right away they can walk around and have full feathers all over their body. They are versatile little animals, the baby shorebirds. Mama will wait around until they can fly, and then she buggers off and the little ones are on their own. Time to eat some food. They spend their time foraging around, fattening up for their long migration to the wintering grounds. They start foraging right away because gaining food and mass is of the utmost importance to these shorebirds. Because they know they have a long distance flight only weeks ahead of them. We we'll call these two Pete and Sammy. Meanwhile, up in Iceland, a whole bunch of different bird species are getting ready for their migration. And they're getting ready by fattening up and getting their feathers all good to go. They all have different leg lengths, beak sizes and lengths as well, for different types of food sources deep within the sand. And when the weather conditions are perfect, they know it's time to go. When the time is right, the birds, like this oyster catcher, will take off on their great migration. They will fly thousands of kilometers or miles across the ocean to get to the wintering grounds. Shorebirds have among the longest flights of any other species of birds in the world. And back in North America, they also get the signal to fly. A combination of magnetism and ultraviolet light guide them along the way. Also the stars are sent to help. During migration you can see large groups of birds as they like to fly in large flocks. Safety in numbers, you know. Some bird species don't have as big of a migration route. Such as this American Avocet. Bird migration is a regular and natural seasonal movement. Migration is built into the genetic code, and they cannot resist the urge to take off and go. And in the spring, they do it all over again. Other birds, like this black-necked stilt, also don't migrate as far. They have special adaptations, like these very long legs, to help them walk around the marshy areas amongst the vegetation. But they migrate nonetheless. They made it! The lesser young legs, Sammy and Pete, have reached Argentina. Bird bros out! There are few phenomena in the natural world as spectacular and visible to us as the annual migration of birds, which has many implications for their biology and conservation. Throughout history, people have noted that some birds seem to either disappear, be seen flying away for the season, and arriving at certain times of year. Of course, some of the thought about what was happening was erroneous, such as Aristotle suggesting swallows hibernate in the water during the winter, which took until nearly 1880 to fully disprove, because disproving wildlife misconceptions is hard for some reason. But many other people throughout history have noticed that birds often seem to have a destination in mind. Whether Polynesians following plovers to islands or several lines in the Bible, noting what we today call phonology, the seasonal timing of natural events. In the New World, the migration of birds between the continents of North and South America each year covers thousands of miles and travels from backyards in North America to the depths of South American jungle, or from the high Arctic to desert oases to tropical beaches all the way to the coasts of Argentina. Last year, with the human ability to travel great distances nearly completely halted, while the birds still migrated through, I thought about how this phenomenon connects people over thousands of miles and across continents. With this in mind, I brought together several wildlife content creators along migration routes to follow the birds on their incredible journeys, and discuss the incredible biological feats and unique conservation challenges these birds must face. 
Hi, this is Summer from Outdoors with Sum, and I'm here to tell you about the queens of migratory birds. We've come to the mudflats, and we're looking at the eastern bar-tailed godwit. In terms of over-the-top evolutionary adaptations for migration, these birds really set the bar. You get it? Because bar-tailed, yeah. ETGBs, EBTGs, ABCDs, have the longest non-stop migration of any migratory bird, 16,000 kilometers. So they truly are the top tier uh, migratory bird. And I am a little biased towards them because they do spend quite a lot of their time here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. If I was to get on a flight from New Zealand to Alaska, it would take 15 hours non-stop. And there would have to be some major perks, some very delicious in-flight meals for me to uh, undergo that. For them, it takes them a week. And these birds do it every year, twice a year. So we have to ask ourselves, why would a bird put in so much effort to fly all the way over there? For one thing, Alaska freezes over for six months of the year. Unless you want to evolve some adaptations for living under the snow, it's a good idea to leave and go somewhere else. So why don't they just spend their time in New Zealand then? Well, uh, over in Alaska, it's the perfect place for them to raise their chicks because there's long summer days and there's plenty of insects and uh, vegetation for them to have fun in over there. So how do they do it? Twice a year, they hoon around the mudflats in New Zealand. Their main food supply is uh, little marine polycate worms that they find in the ground, almost becoming morbidly obese. But godwits have got to keep their wits about them. Yes, I did it again. It's a very delicate balance to become as fat as possible while still being able to fly. And they have to fly at 60 kilometers per hour. So how can they physically make enough room in their body to store all of this fat? Since while they're flying, they don't have to eat. And so the godwits just said, you know what? There's all this free real estate inside my body that I can use to store some extra fat. They absorb their digestive organs because extra protein, why not? And that makes room for all of this extra fat because they're not gonna be eating while they're flying. Isn't that just insane? The other physiological adaptations that they have is they will molt all of their flight feathers just before they leave and they'll grow some new ones, some bright shiny new feathers. And they'll also change components of their blood so that they can burn fat more efficiently. So from September to March, we Kiwis get to share our beautiful country with these amazing, migratory birds. Then it's the Northern Hemisphere's chance to admire these birds in all of their glory while they raise their chicks under the Alaskan sun. Then after only four months, those chicks will begin their own OE, they'll fly over to New Zealand for the world's finest marine worms and all the sheep friends they could possibly want. Most larger shorebirds need to build up fat deposits that will be 30 to 50 percent of their total weight to prepare for long intercontinental flights. These fat reserves give them a range of over 3,000 kilometers, but for a bird like this yellow legs, when the distance between Argentina and the Arctic is some 10,000 kilometers, these birds need to find stopovers where they can replenish their fat reserves quickly to tackle the next leg of their journey. One such refueling spot, a convenient 3,000 kilometers from the Arctic tundra breeding grounds, is the Great Salt Lake of Utah. This lake is the hypersaline remains of a massive ice age lake that once covered much of the region, and around its margins are vast wetlands in the middle of the arid Great Basin Desert. Home to five globally important bird areas, this lake likely plays host to millions of migrating birds each year, both using it as a pit stop and as a breeding site. The lake is saltier than the ocean and so is home to no fish, but has an incredible amount of invertebrate life, such as brine flies, whose larvae grow up in the salty waters and then hatch out in vast numbers that carpet the shoreline which offers food to migrating birds. To get at the invertebrate bounty, each bird has its own strategies to collect the food it needs to refuel. Some snatch them right out of the air, while others take the yawning jogger approach, running down the shore with an open mouth, inhaling the cloud of flies taking off ahead of them. Some birds are much more refined, with different beak shapes and lengths. Some use their beak to probe into the mud. Others, like the avocets, have an upturned bill that is pretty useless at probing, but they effectively use it to sweep across the surface to feed. Ducks like the northern shoveler filter feed using special comb-like structures to strain out food. In deeper water are grebes and phalarope, 
The Great Salt Lake is a critical staging area for the Wilson's phalarope, with a third of the global population coming here to refuel both before making the push to the Arctic and on their way back as they head for South America. They have one of the more unique feeding strategies. They swim in tight circles, creating a gentle vortex that brings food items within reach of their beaks. Tiny forest-dwelling wood warblers must also find a way to build up fat reserves to travel between the eastern woodlands of North America and northern South America. With fat reserves representing 40% of their weight, they can travel about 100 hours non-stop. Like with the shorebirds, though, there are so many species that they must find different ways to get the food they need. One of the most famous ornithological studies ever, MacArthur 1958, found that each species of warbler in a habitat has a slightly different ecology to avoid interspecies competition. Cape May warblers feed high in the crowns of trees. Yellow-rumped warblers are more generalists, feeding throughout trees. Black-throated green warblers feed in the dense foliage around new buds, sticking mainly to the middle of trees and flying between branches. Blackburnian warblers feed on higher branches, working from the limb base out to its tip, looking for insects, and bay-breasted warblers tend to stay near the trunks of pine trees, looking for food in dense patches of lichen. These different strategies allow each bird to not directly compete for the same insects and thus all can live in the same habitat. With their fat reserves full, the birds are ready to begin their migration, but how do they know which direction to go? How does a bird only a few centimeters long navigate across continents? Birds travel over long distances without seeming to get lost. But how do they do it? I asked some birds to find out. <laughs> Excuse me, how does bird navigation work? Excuse me, how does a bird flock know where to go? Uh, okay, maybe later. How does a bird flock not get lost? They weren't willing to tell me their secrets. But people have done some studies to learn more about birds' navigation cues, and it's really quite diverse. Birds have been shown using the position of the sun during the day and the position of stars at night. They can navigate using polarized light even when it's cloudy. They use Earth's magnetic field. They use landmarks, both by sight and by smell, but these are less important. There is some evidence that birds have a pre-programmed sense of which direction to fly and how long to fly. And when in doubt, they can just follow other birds, and hopefully their flock knows where it's going. And here's the thing. I think we have still not discovered all the methods that birds use to navigate. There are still discoveries out there waiting for us to find them. Or for a bird to tell us. Is there anything that humans don't know about bird navigation? Bye! Even with this incredible ability to navigate, the journey is perilous and birds must face many hazards. For many of the tiny warblers traveling out of the Caribbean and northern South America, they must fly over the Gulf of Mexico a harrowing journey over the open ocean with no way to stop and rest or refuel if a storm hits in the middle of migration season, creating headwinds that these tiny birds must fight. For the birds that make it through a storm such as this, they land at the first available land, completely exhausted. This phenomenon, known as fallout, is famous among bird watchers as one can see hundreds of birds all in one place. More and more frequently, however, birds must contend with man-made hazards on their migrations. Because these birds rely on strategic spots to refuel, habitat loss is a threat to migration. The Great Salt Lake is receding as less and less water replenishes it each year, through both declining precipitation due to long-term drought in the region and the excessive growth of human habitation in northern Utah. Growth like this creates further problems, with birds directly being impacted by things of human construction. At night, human cities are lit up by artificial lights, during migration, nearly 80% of migrants travel through the night. Artificial light messes with bird navigation, competing with the natural moon and stars. Some birds become completely disoriented in lights and end up flying in circles or are drawn close to a large lit skyscraper, which they collide with. It is estimated that millions of birds are killed each year due to light pollution, which is why there are many campaigns to push governments and individuals to turn off lights at night, which, if you are able to, please turn all your lights off at night. The way these lights are powered is also a major threat to migrants. 
Wind turbines are often blamed for bird declines, but actually have less of an effect on migrants, especially nocturnal migrants as they tend to fly at high altitude. Instead, most collisions are larger diurnal and local birds, which is why methods of bird detection and avoidance will have a big impact on how wind farms affect avian communities. Wind turbines also just don't kill that many birds when compared to window strikes or collisions with power lines, which each kill hundreds of millions of birds each year. Migrants also are at risk from climate change, with increasing storm prevalence and intensity making their journeys more treacherous, and the increasing temperature causing an issue known as phenological mismatch. Birds leave from their wintering grounds based on seasonal cues that result in them arriving on their breeding grounds just before highest invertebrate abundance. But with warming temperatures, invertebrates are at highest abundance earlier and earlier, meaning the birds, and more importantly their chicks, are too late to take advantage of the most abundant food. Basically, they just come a little too late to the buffet, and only a few bites of food are left. Beyond these more physical challenges, protecting migratory birds is challenging because in the process of crossing continents, they cross political boundaries, and so preserving this phenomenon takes international treaties, the most famous of which being the Migratory Bird Act. Believe it or not, migratory birds weren't always protected. That's why I was asked to share with you some of the insights into what led to the protection of migratory birds. Sometimes I find by looking back into history, it can help us going forward with the future of protecting the amazing animals around us. In particular, there are three events that I think really highlight both the devastation that humans can bring as well as the passion of one person that can really make a difference. First up is fashion, and no, I'm not referring to the David Bowie song, but the fashion of wearing feathers or even sometimes whole birds on one's hat. Beginning in the 18th century, this practice of wearing feathers was quite common in Europe, but didn't make its way across the pond in such an intensity until the end of the 1800s. During this time, there was a lot of change happening in America, with both industrialization and urbanization, which could have led people to want to bring nature closer to them, bring them closer outdoors. But instead of going out and maybe spending more time outdoors, they brought it to them, quite literally, by wearing birds on their heads, which might seem a bit odd, but to wealthy women of the day, that was the pinnacle of fashion. Now, at this point, the mindset that there are just so many birds that what could this harmless human activity have on their populations was rather common. Yet sadly, regions like the Everglades in Florida suffered greatly, especially populations of herons and egrets, whose feathers were highly sought after for these fashionable hats. Now, I mentioned this trend started in Europe, which is where I'll take us back to, to meet the mother of birds. I'm talking, of course, about the amazing Etta Lemon. She was born in 1860 over here in England and was the co-founder of the all-female organization that later would become the RSPB, aka the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which coincidentally enough was founded in 1889 to stamp out the fashion of wearing feathers and hats. She certainly fought long and hard, but it was well worth it, for she successfully lobbied Parliament for a plumage importation ban, a bill that was later passed in 1921. But she wasn't alone in the fight to ban using birds in fashion. It's important to note the foundation of the Audubon societies as well. In particular, in 1886, George Grinnell published the Sportsman magazine, Forest and Stream, which published a variety of different articles, ranging from condemning the use of birds in fashion, but also expressing concerns that the unregulated hunting of birds would lead to the extinction of certain species. So luckily, not all hope was lost. But what's next? Thank you, Shelby. It was with this growing concern for the future of migratory birds that the government began passing laws. New York State would ban the sale of native bird plumes in 1910. Then, in 1913, the United States federal government would pass the Weeks-McLean Act, which would limit hunting and the importation of feathers. This act, however, was not that strong, and so in 1918 it was replaced when the Migratory Bird Act was signed into law. 
The Migratory Bird Act essentially protects all native North American bird species by making it illegal to kill, transport, capture, sell, possess, or trade migratory birds, their feathers, their eggs, or their nests in the signatory countries of the United States, Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Russia. This includes incidental take, or when the actions of a person or company lead to the death of birds, like wind farms, buildings, oil spills, and power lines, which can result in fines, which is the part of the act under the most attack by certain political affiliations. Anyone who kills birds for hunting or science needs a permit from the government, as does any party capturing birds in order to ban them or keep them in captivity, like a zoo or a falconer. Migratory bird treaties also exist in other countries, like the European Union's Bird Directive, or more broadly in the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals, which works to protect species that require international cooperation because they cross borders, both birds and other migratory animals like whales and elephants. It has what are called agreements, which are basically full treaties to protect some specific group, such as the Agreement on the Conservation of African Eurasian Migratory Waterbirds. The Convention also has memorandums of understanding, which are not legally binding, but do aim to protect specific groups across international borders, like the Memorandum of Understanding on the Conservation of Southern South American Migratory Grassland Bird Species and their Habitats. Once birds have made it through the daunting process of migration through many perils, some natural, others man-made, they reach their breeding grounds and begin to nest. But here they face more threats, particularly from predators that take advantage of the seasonal influx of birds and their eggs. Migratory birds face a number of threats even after they reach their nesting site, and one of the primary dangers is predation. Raccoons and opossums will routinely predate upon the birds' eggs and nestlings, and feral cats have been known to eat the adults as well. Corvids, like crows and ravens, eat all three, the nestlings, the eggs, and the adults, which means that there are a number of species all predating upon these birds. Another threat that migratory birds face is that of brood parasitism, where a parasitic species of bird will lay its egg into the nest of another species. The host is now responsible for taking care of the egg and raising the young of the parasitic species. This has been observed with the cowbirds, a group of birds that are obligate parasites. They must lay their eggs in the nest of another species. In order to understand why the host species couldn't just eject the egg from the parasite, the brown-headed cowbird and the prothonotary warbler were studied. It was found that if the warbler tried to eject the cowbird's egg, in 56% of cases, the cowbird mother would return and destroy the warbler's nest. If they tried to rebuild it, the cowbird would come back and destroy the warbler's nest a second time in 85% of cases. This is a fascinating example where even another bird laying eggs can become a challenge for migratory birds. Despite these hardships, migratory birds remain successful and they are persistent in the face of these potential dangers. If they survive the gauntlet of predators and fledged chicks, as the air begins to chill with autumn's arrival, the birds must fly towards the tropics and face all the perils of migration again. After a summer in the high arctic, phalarope stage on the Great Salt Lake before making the journey towards South America. Not all birds, though, take the same path they came north on. Blackpole warblers migrated from South America, through the Caribbean, then on to Florida and up the east coast to reach their breeding grounds. To get back, they fly straight south across the open seas of the Atlantic to South America over the course of a non-stop three-day flight, because they want to go on that tropical vacation so badly. After traveling great distances across continents, birds arrive in their wintering range, which may look very different from their breeding range. Warblers that nest in the boreal forests of North America are now in lush rainforest, surrounded by the great diversity of tropical birds and animals that do not migrate. Here they live very different lives that take advantage of this ecosystem. Kentucky and Wilson's warblers join antbirds and many opportunistic tropical species following swarms of army ants through the leaf litter that chase insects out of their hiding places. Other odd quirks also appear. After raising chicks together all summer, golden-winged warbler pairs cannot wait to get away from each other, wintering in completely different areas and habitats. The males head to the higher elevation wet forests, while the females go to drier, lower elevation habitats. This phenomenon is known as sexual segregation, 
and if not accounted for, conservation will be harder, as one sex may be found in more protected areas, while the other in places more likely to be deforested, thus reducing the effective population size. In their wintering ranges, especially in tropical nations like my home country of Ecuador, migratory birds are currently facing some major threats to their survival. Due to climate change, rising temperatures are forcing birds to move up higher in elevation in search of cooler environments. However, as you go up in elevation, there is less area available. Therefore, there is less suitable habitat for these birds to live in. This area is even further diminished by deforestation, which is the number one cause of biodiversity loss in general in the tropics. Agriculture plantations, pastures for livestock, and urbanization to accommodate growing populations are all major contributors to the deforestation crisis. Avian migration is truly one of the most wondrous phenomena on our planet, and is something that truly connects everyone on Earth, even if they do not notice. But for people who do go out and experience nature, it is amazing to think that this bird in Argentina will fly up to the Arctic and will show up on beaches in Mexico or out in the middle of the North American desert. Or think of how a tiny warbler that has been living in the dense rainforests of the Guyana Shield will fly through the tropical paradises of the Caribbean through Florida, up the coast of eastern North America, all the way to the boreal forests of Canada to breed. In order to protect migratory birds, put up decals in order to discourage birds from hitting them. Keep your cats indoors, and make sure to turn off your lights at night, or at least point them down and shield them from above. Another important thing you can do is aid science in understanding migration by going birding and then recording what you see in a community science program online, such as eBird or iNaturalist. These community science programs help track bird populations and migration patterns over time and are thus invaluable information. So what are you waiting for? Go out birding. Anyway, I would like to thank you for all sticking to the end of this video. And I would really like to thank all of my collaborators that helped create this um, video. So a big thank you to Summer from Outdoors with Sum, Steve from Biobush, Shelby from Shelby on Safari, Harrison and Evan, the Wildlife Brothers, and Emilio from Animal Encounters. I would also like to have a big thank you to the Bird Bros for creating and narrating the little story segment. And a big thank you to Fucando from Buscado Fauna for supplying the footage of birds down in Argentina. Could not have made this video without you. Thank you so much. You can find links to all the collaborators' channels in the iCards and down in the description below. This video is part of my Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series. You can find the whole playlist right here for right now or after you get back from birding if you decide to go out and just go birding right now, which you should. Go birding then come back.